All right, everybody, we'll let you join us. Welcome. Uh, today's event, uh, we're focused on financial best practices for adult sports organizations. I'm your host, Jeremy Goldberg. I'm the president and quarterback at League Apps, uh, and we're excited to have you here with, for an incredible panel, an incredible conversation uh, aimed at really helping the adult sports organizations out there uh, really navigate a lot of the challenges as we think about this return to play. Um, and a few things I'll say by way of context. First is I want to thank a, a co-sponsor of, of today's event, uh, the SSIA. Uh, I think most of us are all familiar with SSIA and how they brought this industry together uh, and them doing that for a long time. So we're excited to, to, to have today's conversation um, uh, with them and, uh, and, and really help adult sports organizations um, get access to some great experts and great information. Um, this is a, 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 seg a sector that's really near and dear to my heart. Um, I, uh, I, one of our panelists, Izzy and I, went to Georgetown together. I played intramurals there. Uh, it's not bragging uh, in the context of this conversation to share that I was the intramural wiffle ball champion uh, at Georgetown in 1998 and 1999. I've got a t-shirt. It's a little beat up to prove it. Uh, and, uh, and then continued that to an illustrious career in New York City in the adult leagues. Uh, many championships to show for it, as well as some broken fingers. Um, but, but one of the things I'll say is, is we appreciate um, kind of what important role uh, that all the organizations out there are going to play in, in reestablishing that sense of normalcy, that sense of return to play. And while so much of the conversation that in Washington uh, and, and broadly within the sports sector is centered on youth sports, uh, we wanted to make sure we were, were having a specific conversation for those organizations aimed at adults uh, and giving them the opportunity to play uh, the social aspect of sport, uh, the, the health benefits of sports, and we recognize that, that importance. Um, the other thing I'll recognize is this has been a, a really challenging journey, and we're actually now speaking at a time of more optimism, you know, compared to where, where we may have been months ago. And as organizations and, and cities open up across the country, um, we wanted to put everyone here in position to be able to do that safely and securely by accessing information to understand kind of the liability and health implications uh, of those decisions, and also understand what's happening in Washington. Uh, what are the different dynamics and, and uh and, and considerations as you're thinking about running your business as an entrepreneur, as, as a sports entrepreneur, uh, what are the things that you can be understanding and anticipating and trying to influence as well? So uh, with that, I'm excited to introduce our panel. Uh, we've got Izzy Klein. Uh, Izzy is, uh, is, is a principal of the Klein Johnson Group. He's got an expertise in government relations and communications, and he weighs, knows way too many things about me, which I hope will not come up today's conversation. Uh, we've got Aaron Colby. Uh, Aaron's a partner at Davis Wright Tremaine. Uh, as I was saying a little bit in the pre-call, uh, usually when you tell me I've, we have a lawyer, I usually get on the phone and try to get off as quickly as possible. But Aaron's actually one of these lawyers that you want to talk to, that you want to listen to. Uh, he's full of great advice and wisdom, and I think can, can locate that advice in the context of how any organization is trying to make decisions. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, we've got Ty Burks. Uh, Ty is the CEO of Players Health, uh, and, and, and Players Health is really a one-stop shop for risk management for sports organizations. And if you don't know it, uh, it's an organization we certainly think really highly of. Uh, here at League Apps. And so I'm going to start the conversation with you, Izzy. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about PPP uh, for the audience that's out there, the, the, the organizations that are listening. And one thing I should say, if, if people have questions, feel free to hit that Q&A tab and uh, we can direct those questions to the panelists. Um, so there's PPP passed, then there's been some fixes to it. And if organizations are out there that are trying to understand, first and foremost, what are some of the modifications and changes that have happened more recently? And what can people expect when it comes to the kind of relief that are aimed at small and medium-sized businesses um, that, that, might, that might be of advantage um, in, in the weeks and months to come for, uh, for youth sports organizations or adult sports organizations, I should say? Thanks, Jeremy. And um, look, for, first, thank you for having me and for assembling uh, a great panel. Um, I know that this industry, having been... Um, uh, a participant for for many years um, and having kids who are participating is uh, is critical um, to uh, the health and well-being of, of of kids and adults alike um, and so you know getting folks informed um, as to what is happening in this space is is really important and the kinds of assistance that are that are out there um, you know there are three main programs um, that um, that Congress has put out there to um, to provide assistance um, to, to groups around the country, businesses around the country, um, the PPP, the Payroll Protection Program, the Economic Injury and, and Disaster Loan Program, uh, which was a pre-existing program at the Small Business Administration, um, and then uh, the Economic Development Administration, EDA grants, um, which, um, which are another um, kind of grants that, that are available. Um, the PPP was seen as kind of the multi-trillion dollar 
um, congressional, uh, you know, kind of emergency fund. Um, it was targeted towards um, small, medium-sized businesses, um, not to exceed, uh, you know, a certain number of employees, not to, um, not to go above a certain amount. Um, and the formulas were, I don't want to say they were arbitrary, um, but, but it, it kind of took your payroll, um, you multiplied it by 2.5. Um, so you basically have like, you know, 10 weeks of, of payroll, um, that you would disperse mostly to your, um, you know, mostly during this, you know, difficult period to, to your employees so that you wouldn't have to let them go. Um, there are a bunch of, you know, other considerations that there, you know, you can use a portion of that money, um, to, to, to pay for debt servicing and to pay for rent or, or, or mortgages, um, and, and so, and utilities. Um, but there were a lot of things that, that weren't covered, um, that, that could have been covered. There, there was kind of a period where you had to use those funds that was somewhat unrealistic in this slowed down economic, um, time. Um, and so Congress came back <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago and they, they made some adjustments to the program. Um, they allowed for a longer payout period um, so that you didn't have to use the, the funds in, you know, eight or eight or 10 weeks. You could use it over a longer period of time um, and you could repay it over a longer period of time. Um, so both of those changes were important. There, there are still some things that need to be tweaked. Unfortunately, there, there's a, there are a number of groups and I'm sure that we have some on the call um, now who are organized as, as 501c somethings um, who are not necessarily included in this, in this, you know, funding stream, they can't apply. Um, those organizations can apply for economic injury loans out of the SBA, which are smaller. Um, and, and many of them, um, can also, um, apply to, to EDA grants, although those have been dried up a little bit. Um, the other question that a lot of folks have right now is, okay, I, I got my PPP loan. Um, I'm about to exhaust my PPP loan. What is Congress going to do? And I think that's actually one of the biggest questions out there. Um, there's still about $130 billion um, left in this, in this PPP fund. Um, and my guess is that some money will, will come back as, as businesses restart and um, the funds will get paid back a little bit. Um, so will Congress allow for you to go and get another PPP loan is one of the biggest questions. So if you've gotten one, it took you through, you know, 10 weeks, but your business is not recovering. You're either in the hospitality business or, or you're in the events business. Um, you're in the youth sports business, right? Um, and, you know, you need to get access to more funds in order to keep things going. Um, that's a big question that Congress is going to be wrestling with. Um, and so I'll, I'll, I'll stop there, but, but I'm sure that there are other questions that, that we can get to yeah. eventually. So Izzy, just to unpack that a little bit, um, so the first thing is, is that, uh, you know, there's the question of, is there additional assistance that might be, might, be, might happen in different ways that will fund small, medium-sized mm -hmm. businesses, uh, for-profit or different kind of nonprofit structures? Uh, what, what's your sense? Do you have a sense of likelihood based on what you're hearing? One thing I should mention about Izzy is he, he, he worked for, 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 for time for uh, the Senate Minority Leader, Chuck Schumer, so he's got a, a good handle on what's happening in Washington. What does your sense or, or, or gut tell you about what, what might happen as it relates to more funding relief for small businesses? So he, here's what I'd say. And, and, you know, I left off one, one chunk of money, and that's really the state and local governments. Um, so a lot of state and local governments have funds that have been established um, either out of their own tax dollars um, or they're getting assistance from the federal government as well to set up um, funds for, for impacted businesses for local government um, efforts, et cetera. Um, my sense um, is that th there are a number of, of bills um, that have been introduced. Um, some are bipartisan, some are not. Um, House Democrats passed a huge bill called the HEROES Act. To, that's a $3 trillion bill um, to expand all of these programs once again to you know, add some new programs. Um, that may or may not see the light of day in the, in the Senate. Um, there are smaller fixes to the PPP to expand so that you can, if you're a 501c6 or c3, you can access the funds which you you know haven't been able to access yet. Um, there are other forms of relief that that Democrats and Republicans are coming together around, mainly around state and local relief. So uh, there's a half a trillion dollar 
um, bill that Menendez and Cassidy in the Senate um, have offered up um, for directly for um, local government uh, assistance. Um, you know, so, so there's, there's a lot that's under consideration. What I think is going to happen um, is that the, the, the various kind of interests, um, you know, who have a, um, who, who have aligned into their members of Congress who have been um, pursuing some additional assistance um, will eventually get um, some kind of agreement between the Democrats and the Republicans, the House and the Senate, um, and of course the White House, um, where they feel like th there are enough tweaks to make, there's enough of the funds have been depleted, um, and there are enough gaps in the coverage um, where another bill, another real bill is needed um, for Congress to, to pass. Uh, that would probably happen in July before the August you know, recess. Um, and so that, that's kind of what I think people are counting on right now. Um, but there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of moving pieces here. Um, and there are, there are folks who are, who are very frustrated with the speed at which um, the SBA is getting money out um, and by the, the strings on the money. And, and so a lot of changes will be made. Izzy, last question, and then we'll pull another panelist so we can always come back to this. I know there's some, some detailed questions that are coming in that you can also take a look at. Is, um, the, there's the Main Street Lending Program, uh, and I'm not sure how familiar you are with that, but my understanding is, is that they're, they're spinning up other ways of getting money into the private sector. In that case, uh, if I understand it correctly, it's not a forgiveness-based loan, but it is something that is calculated that if you're a profitable organization in a small business, uh, that you can be eligible for kind of long-term loans and relief. So whether it's EDAs or, or, or Main Street Lending, I don't know if there's anything else you want to comment about the kind of assistance that may be available for small, medium-sized organizations. So the, the, the Main Street Lending um, uh, facility that, that the Fed and, and Treasury have been standing up, and it's taken quite a while, actually, um, that was intended for larger businesses. I mean, when we think of small businesses, I think we think of like the, the dry cleaner or the sub shop down the street, um, not necessarily kind of a, a 10 or 15,000 person business or, you know, multi-million dollar affair. Um, and so this, this other facility that, that was created was really intended for, for larger institutions, um, while the PPP was kind of to get that small and group of companies. Um, and so we'll see if, if the, the larger businesses take it up um, and if that has any trickle down effect on, on any of um, the smaller loans that have been, that have been um, put out there. Um, but it's a, it's a good question. We haven't seen so, its impact yet. So one, one thing, so I'll bring Aaron Colby into the conversation. So there's the question of financing, keep organizations afloat, and we'll return to some of the questions. Ryan, I see your question uh, that has a lot of detailed provisions. And then there's the question as, as Aaron, as organizations are returning to play again, right, opening back up um, or thinking about that, what, what are the ways or the considerations they should be thinking about liability as it relates to their employees, as it relates to liability related to um, the, uh, the, the, the participants and the people that they're servicing? You know, what, what are the similar ways that they might approach that and the, the key considerations for that? Well, you set the, the table up uh, well. So what I was going to say is, is that you should be focused um, on what facing the documents or who you're talking about, right? You have participants um, in the league. You have um, visitors or people, guests who would come on to, you know, the, where games are being played to watch, but they're not necessarily participants. Um, and then you obviously have employees of the league um, or workers or contractors, whatever you want to call them, the people that are performing services for the league, right? In all those situations, you have liability, especially in this, where there's an airborne illness. Um, you, in every situation, and then, then there's the fourth, which is the government, whether that's the city, the county, um, the state, or the federal government, um, there's too many regulatory agencies to even name that if one of those um, government bodies decides that you're operating outside the confines, they could just go like this and one of the agencies could come down on you. Um, you know, most recently in California, you see the struggle between masks and no masks. Um, and you see it, what happened was is that the, the, the federal government has said, look, we're not gonna make a requirement. The CDC makes a recommendation, but that's not a requirement. Then you have the state of California saying, well, we're gonna have an approach 
where it's county by county. And depending on the business, you know, a sports league, unfortunately, is late um, because of the spectators and all of that um, in the phase. But the counties can apply for certain businesses to be open. Um, and you can see that it's being pushed down politically. Um, but then when there's an issue, like there was in Orange County, where the public health officer was screamed at and ultimately had to resign over what, because she ordered masks to be worn. Um, and the county supervisors didn't want it. So then you had the state come in and issue a mask order. And the reason why I'm illustrating this is because this is complicated, right? You've got to be up to date on it like this. You know, I just basically explained the politics behind why you saw on CNN, like some little bottom line that says California governor orders masks. Um, your takeaway um, as league operators is not what's the minimum should I provide? Your takeaway is what's the max should I provide? You don't want to be waiting for the jurisdiction to say whether you need masks or not. The bottom line is have masks. Um, and I'm, you know, this is about as political as I'll get in this. I understand there's lots of people that believe and don't believe about certain things about this, but when you're operating a, a business that's a totally different ball of wax, you have no idea who's going to be the decision maker, you have no idea whether it's a juror, you know, God forbid, or an insurance adjuster who may deny coverage because you've signed up on your insurance policy saying, I promise to comply with law. And the county says that you have to maintain social distancing and, and institute the protocol in simple form. And you just ran that red light. And so the biggest takeaway I can say when you're reopening is before you do anything, look at the bodies that apply to you, most particularly your county. Look at your industry because there's industry specific guidance and see what you have to do um, and do it. Because if you're not doing that, doesn't matter the waivers, doesn't matter what you have people sign, you know, it, you're going to have a potential exposure or be accused of it. Um, and then you're not able to even say, hey, look, we're operating in confines with the law. We've done what we're supposed to do. So it's, it's, a, it's an important point. And, and I think the, 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 so the first thing is, is that you've got to make sure you have access to that information. And Aaron, what I think I hear you saying is that information in and of itself may be fluid. So part of what you have got to assume is, is to anticipate where that might go and then say, hey, if, if that, that your protection comes not from a signed piece of paper, but ultimately if you adhere to the policies that, that we understand. Um, Ty, I'll bring you into the conversation because when you think about this question of the risks and this is your world, you live with, you know, work with sports organizations, and you think about being this kind of one-stop shop with risk management, what are the risk considerations that you think uh, these adult sports organizations should be keeping in mind as it relates to how they're reopening or preparing to return to play? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think what I'd like to do is definitely piggyback off of what Aaron said, is that these organizations, more often than not, um, you know, organizations are like, well, what is the minimum kind of threshold or boxes that I need to check to get my organization back up? Really figuring out exactly what is the best case scenario, what is the best or safest environment that I can expose my athletes to, that is the lever of measure or standard of care that these organizations are being held to. And so I think there's some of things, some things that organizations definitely need to be thinking about. Um, one of them is specifically around daily attestations. Um, that is definitely something that a lot of organizations are doing today. Um, some organizations are using uh, a Google Sheet to do their daily attestation. An attestation is just a, a symptoms check. All of the athletes have to come in and communicate, hey, I either have come in contact with someone that has had COVID or I don't have any symptoms. Now, one of the things that we're seeing, and this is not the case with adult sports, but with youth sports, parents have to do the attestation. This is something that has to be done daily. Every time they show up for a practice, every time they show up for a game. And then when you have an alert via that attestation, what do you do then? Is that process set up? Are your roles and responsibilities in place? Do all of your coaches know exactly what actions they should take if someone said in this survey that they have had a fever or they have headaches or they've come in contact with someone with COVID? And then how does your organization respond to that if they've already attended practice? And how do you go about communicating that to the overall public? So as Aaron said, there's going to be an exposure to the risk of someone coming in contact or have had some type of symptoms, how your organization is communicating that is really ensuring that there's proper policies and protocols around return to play and how you're gonna handle these specific incidents. And also be aware that the season is not promised. Just because you start it doesn't mean you're gonna finish. 
and communicating that ahead of time to members is really important because you may have a good two weeks and then you may have a COVID exposure, two or three of your members or spectators um, have COVID and then your season's done. And so I just think without, you know, talking about the doom and gloom, I think we have to be prepared for all scenarios really. Do you think, um, uh, uh, I, I guess uh, as a follow-up to that, when you think about the, the, the question of liability that an organization has, is it, it how is it related to the insurance? Is it related to a potential lawsuit or action that they might take? Is it a question of like the refunds that may be that may be tied to the, the financial liability that you might have associated with this? But Ty, how how do you kind of compartmentalize the different considerations that, that people should have? Yeah, unfortunately, they have to worry about all those things. Um, specifically for the insurance, I've only seen one insurance carrier slash policy that doesn't have an, uh, a communicable disease exclusion on it. Every organization that we've sold insurance to, all of the carriers that we work with, they all have a communicable disease exclusion. So that means if there is a liability incident or, or um, an incident that you have within your organization, you know, you're, you're pretty much liable for it. Now, what is being considered in the insurance marketplace right now is legal defense. So having specific insurance where you can get legal defense coverage, now it doesn't cover the overall lawsuit, but it may cover the, 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 the fees for you to have a lawyer, uh, you know, represent your organization. I think another thing outside of just waivers and insurance is that the organization as a whole, there's, as I said before, there's no guarantee that the season is actually going to finish. So event cancellation coverage doesn't cover communicable diseases. So organizations have to understand that those are the risks that they have. And I think really understanding kind of the near term, of course, everyone's trying to get sports back up. We can't miss a registration season. And so financially, we're trying to get things up and going, but making sure that we don't cut the corners to make that happen, I think is going to help the organization long term. If they can communicate that they've done everything in their power to number one, comply with the state and how that state has advised them to re reopen, and then going above and beyond what is currently represented just within the CDC, I think it's going to help that organization go a long way. Waivers, all of those things have to be in place. So it just can't just be waivers and you think you're good. You have to have the waiver. You have to think about how the insurance component, what is registration? What is your communication? What is your return to play protocol? What is your code of conduct around these things? All of that has to be addressed. And so we actually put together a return to play manual for a lot of organization. It talks about how they, how they should assess their organization prior to opening. It talks about phases to reopening in terms of how they start practices, how they start games, and then how do you populate that game? And then it talks about testing. And so I think what we're starting to see that in, in a lot of states now, testing is now required. Um, we actually had a, a large organization, event organizer, cancel all of their events because the state of Florida requires that they have to have tests for all of their athletes. These tests are like $250 per user. Um, that's a lot of money for a lot of these organizations. So we're starting yep. to see that come down the pipe. So Aaron, just to bring you back in here, when you talk about liability and the risks, I mean, you know, we can talk about the, the best practices here of making sure you would go above and beyond, understanding where your county's coming in, uh, the access stations, we'll get into all those things. But, but when an organization thinks about the risk to them, what, what are the realistic risks that they should be worried about or how do they prioritize what those risks are? I think the risk is that you're more likely to have an exposure and have to shut down than you are not. That if you are going to operate between now and, and I say this coming from a place of experience, I've, I've been on committees and help open up restaurants in LA. Um, and I'm doing the same for film and TV production around the country. And no matter, and film and TV production is much like sports where it's got a very tight, um, type of regime when it comes to how you can open up you know so for instance this is not just the wear a mask stay six, six feet apart and you're good to go um you know uh, based on what ty i couldn't say it better than ty is that you know you better look into it because you don't know what the requirements are going to be where you are you know there's a production that was good to go they had put thousands of dollars to it and they realized oh shoot we have a requirement that they have clean tests and then we have to test within 24 hours and we can't get tests in Timbuktu, wherever they were, you know, doing it. It was really somewhere far away when they, they had to blow up the whole production. Um, 
And the other thing is, is expectations, okay? There, to, there, you have to understand that it's not just your, you know, you have to look at three buckets. One bucket is your brand, your customer satisfaction, retention, and all those things beyond just this year. Your other bucket is insured risk. The third bucket is uninsured risk, okay? You're going to mitigate the insured and uninsured risk by managing expectations. And so, you know, you need to open back up and you don't say, we're doing all these things and you're going to be safe and we think you're good to go. You know, you need to say, we're doing all these things and you need to understand there's still a risk. Um, but despite of that, everyone can make their own decision. You know, when it's voluntary, you don't want to push people at all. You have to make a decision on what's a critical mass and not internally. Um, you know, because it's great and dandy if you want to have a league, but if you, you know, typically rely on 100% sign up for the revenue and you can't operate less than 40% sign up, it doesn't matter what you say. If you're at 30%, what have you done? You've ticked off 70% who think you're an idiot for opening up. And now you've ticked off the 30% for misleading them, thinking you're going to actually give them a lead. And so I'm not saying that you should, um, you know, just close up shop until there's a vaccine, but you don't necessarily want to be the first one out of the gate. Let someone else make mistakes. Um, and you want to look closely at what your industry group's doing locally. Track what they're doing, because a lot of these, the requirements are going to change. And you're going to ultimately, you know, the resources you rely on, your insurance broker or agent or company, they do give great materials. They're not always end all be all. You know, the attorneys that are participants in your league or on your board, um, if you have any dollars, you know, try to get a flat fee to go to a law firm and say, you know, okay, we are uh, this type of sports league in this county, um, this amount of people, this amount of employees, here's the target date we would like to open up you know, here's what we have so far. Here's what we need. What do you think it would take to get us some documents in order to allow us to do that? Um, because you then need, you need to understand before you go invest what it takes. If you're going to have to test all these, all the kids, the participants, very difficult to do because right now there's not, you have to look at testing from a variety of standpoints, right? There's cost, but there's also turnaround time. It does no good if you're going to test Johnny baseball player and it's going to come back in seven days and like, you know, he's picked his friend's nose during that time, right? And so, and, and also how much, um, how wide, how much was the availability you can get of these tests? So a lot, a lot of different considerations. I mean, is one of the things overhanging this, this liability question is also what's happening in Washington. Are there, are there legislative efforts that also we should, they should account for even as they're developing the best practices around safety that as we think about liability where, where Washington's coming in? Yeah I mean Ty and Aaron have, have really kind of laid out the, the, the real world problem. Um, there's a consortium of businesses, universities, travel organizations that are all pushing um, Congress to enact some kind of liability reform um, not to give people a free pass, but but to to give businesses some certainty that if they do the right things according to the CDC, um, that they will um, they will not be held liable for a person getting sick, which may or may not be their fault. Um, and so I think that this is always a conversation that that wraps um, DC up into knots. Um, and you know I think that there's. Um, there's definitely more interest um, on the on the Republican side of the ledger to to move larger liability reform um, forward than there is on the Democratic side, um, but Democrats recognize um, that that you can't begin to reopen things and return to normalcy without some kinds of protections in place um, for the businesses that are um, putting themselves at risk. Uh, by by doing that reopening, um, and so my guess is that if there is a bigger package that moves forward in in July, that it probably will include some liability reforms, and they will probably be looking backward um, and looking forward. So there will be some safe harbor um, that's given for for businesses, organizations who are who are kind of in this really tough spot, um, and I think. You know, look, if, if, a, if a business is, is, is negligent um, and just kind of throws open its doors and, 
and doesn't advise its customers to do something or doesn't advise its members to, um, to, to do the right thing, that, that's going to be a problem in, you know, in any liability situation. Um, but I think the, the other, the other piece here that, you know, isn't, isn't getting discussed quite as much is, is the different levels of, of requirements, whether you, you know, are looking at the state, the local or the, or the federal government, um, guidance. Um, and that's, that's particularly troubling, um, that there seems to be no real floor, no real ceiling on, on what organizations can and should be doing. Um, and that's part of our, you know, our federal system, right? I mean, we have a, a system that allows for, for this kind of, um, you know, different views on, on how to implement safety and, and, you know, and health, uh, provisions and whatnot. Um, and so having folks come to some kind of agreement on, on what that means, um, for, for businesses and for organizations, um, is also going to be really important. Um, so Ty, when we talk about in, in notwithstanding the possibility and potential of reform, so you have these organizations that are out there. And one of the things that my general sense of what I've observed is that some of the uh, adult, uh, uh, some of the youth sports organizations have started opening first. So to Aaron's point about being first, there's actually an opportunity for a lot of the adult organizations to see what's happening. And some organizations have already come back and observe and learn and, and see, see whatnot. And, and certainly one of the functions that the SSIA, I think, is certainly playing is helping to establish industry best practices or circulate those practices, which I think Aaron has emphasized. But to put a fine point on the insurance question, so if insurance carriers are going to exclude this, then the, the best protection, I think what you're saying, that organizations have is to develop the best possible standards for safety and to rely on that, you know, rely on that as a standard because it's unrealistic to expect that they're going to get any kind of, uh, any kind of liability related coverage connected to, to COVID. Is that, a, is that a fair read on this? That is correct. I think as of right now, now, of course, you know, the marketplace is trying to find a solution for where we're at, but similar to terrorism insurance, there is a government funded program called TRIA where we get this coverage from. I feel like that's what's gonna have to happen if we're gonna see more national liability coverage for something that is as broad as this. Right. So outside, so what you can do, you're suggesting, is to go out and get insurance uh, related to potentially legal related insurance. Uh, and then I guess the question is, is what about participation related ex ex insurance? Is there things that people can offer at the participant level uh, that might protect people and gets refunds? And, or is that not necessarily tied into um, coverage connected to, to these kinds of issues? There are a lot of sports refund programs that are out, but they're all and, and, and to this point, and this is where we're starting to see that, we have a, two organizations that we work with now, and they have registration refunds that they provide for illness. And so they're having a huge problem rewriting their policies because now the organizations are now coming down with this exclusion. So the policy that protected me that, hey, if my kid got mono, <laughs> you know, you know, two weeks into the season, I'd be covered and then I'd get my registration back is no longer available now. And so I think there's just, there's a huge change happening with how we view, like, how do we cover these organizations for this? And as Aaron said, these organizations opening, setting clear expectations around number one, what the refund policy looks like. Um, a lot of organizations haven't been forthcoming with that um around how they're going to manage refunds because everyone's trying to figure out how they're going to handle it themselves but i think setting very clear expectations around how we're going to deal with refunds in the case of of an incident like this um i think it's something that organizations just need to be forthcoming with and it's i've seen a bunch of different policies around how they're going to manage refunds but it's particularly real it's really up to the organization and how they want to manage it but um, th th we know there's costs and everything associated with those registration fees. So it's really going to be taking the risk of how that organization want to do it. Yeah, but I think specific to coverage, I, I don't think any organization can lean on their insurance uh, uh, policy to say we're going to be covered in this scenario. One, one thing I, I also uh, kind of hear you saying as, as you describe kind of how organizations are part of it and preparing for refunds is one is people are signing up now in a COVID environment, which is different than maybe the right. seasons that were interrupted. So part of it is, is that 
you know, if you're hiding behind a policy, it's not going to be good enough. You've got to make sure you're communicating this in a way so that people, you know, feel part of it. One, one of the, this, a couple of things that I've seen organizations do is one is figure out ways of co-developing it with their with their customers, right? So one of the things to say is, hey, guys, here's how we're thinking about it. Go to the team captains, go to other people, and say, hey, we want to create an environment. People want to get playing. They, they want a sense of normalcy. There's also a real sense that maybe there's some interruption. So, so how, what are the best ways we would think about this? And, and one of the things that I've seen organizations do is, you know, set up things like a payment plan or, or, or break up in payments where it's like, hey, the first aspects of what your dues are covering all the fixed costs of the organization just so we can operate. The rest is more variable. So for some reason, if we shut down, you're not exposed. So there may be ways of thinking a little bit more creative. The other thing is, is that the price point for some of the adult sports organizations is lower. So that if, if people are losing 75 or 100 or $150, maybe it's more tolerable uh, especially if organizations see that, that that the organization in question is communicating why they're making such a sa uh, effort to come to return safely as well. Yeah. So that proactive communication is really, really important. Um, Aaron, you want really to add to that? Sorry. Oh, sorry. No, I was no, going to say, really say another really important, I think from an insurance perspective, is getting your refund for your premium. Now, this has been huge for a lot of organizations because when you pay that premium, it's really important that before you pay it, they're looking at their policies to figure out how much of that premium is earned. So if 100% of that premium is earned, you're not getting a refund. Say 25% of it is earned, that means you can get 75% of, uh, of your premium back if it cancels early. And this is really important for larger organizations when you all could potentially be paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for your premium. And if 100% if of that is earned, which 90% which of it wouldn't be, but say 25% of it is earned, then that $100,000 you pay, you're only getting 75K back. And so I think a lot of organizations need to really look and see how much of the premium is earned before they pay that premium as well. Because as I said before, there's no guarantee that the season will come, will finish. And by earned, define earned, what, what do you mean by how a premium gets earned? Well, how, how most insurance companies view a policy, um, you pay a one year policy, that policy is amortized over the course of that year. And so some carriers may say, when you pay us that premium, that 100% of that, we're going to count as earned and it's ours. So whether you cancel your policy or not, we may not give you a refund for it. Every insurance company has a different policy around how they view that. And it's going to come down to when you cancel the policy. So maybe you get that, maybe you get a 30 day free look and you're going to have, you get 100% of your premium back. But after that 30 days, it's 100% earned. Those are the terms that organizations really need to get a very clear understanding on before they pay out those premiums. Because if you're two, three weeks into the season and you have to cancel, that policy is yours. You know, you may still be on that payment plan. You still owe that insurance company that money unless you want to cancel your policy. And as I said before, you may not get all of it back. Okay. Aaron, we were going to jump in here. And when you think about this perspective of uh, how uh, as organizations are returning, you know, one of the things I'm specific, you know, I, I think is a question that I, that I've been uh, that I've been asked is, well, don't people understand the risks? You can't hide behind the fact you don't know what the risks of COVID. So if an organization is doing all the right things, what level of protection does that claim provide? And then also, when you talk about waivers, like why are waivers important? Um, and and does it just is there a distinction between your employees and your customers in, ter in terms of the way you think about structuring those things? Yeah. So. Um why it matters is the is that people are not going to agree that you're always doing everything right you can always say at the beginning we're going to do something you write that intro email hey we're going to reopen up you may have seen on the news that sports leagues can come back in such and such county we're going to do this we're going to hear all the procedures we're going to do all this right and then you have like two weeks and some you know the the hand sanitizer is out or you're out of masks or, you know, someone doesn't fill out or you're relying on self-reporting. So someone does, you know, shows up to the field without filling out a medical questionnaire, you know, and then everyone's, you know, and there's an exposure and everyone's ticked off that you weren't doing temperature checks. Um, or that, you know, whatever parameter you put around, you know, wasn't kept. Right. And so then, you, you know, everyone's on the same page, but now they're not. Right. And so in that particular scenario, you obviously want to be prepared to be like, listen, this is we were doing what was required of us, what we told, and we made this clear at the beginning. And so I think that key, first email is very key. I mean, what I, what I, the notes I took down is consider a shorter season, right? You look what all the major, major leagues are doing. Baseball's, you know, talking about if they can get over the labor issues, they're talking about a 60-game season. The NBA's got that, you know, they're going down to Disneyland and they're going to pay like 20 games. 
you know, and so, you know, you can think about doing shorter seasons. Great. You get through the first season, do another one. If you didn't, you've mitigated your, your loss when there's, you know, an, ex, an exposure and you have to shut down. And when we say exposure, it doesn't mean just like seasons off, but for instance, in Los Angeles, you know, when there's exposure, what you have to immediately do is, is okay. Anyone who within the, first, the last 48 hours of when the person that's the infected person that either had symptoms or tested positive, for that 48 hour period before that, were they within six feet of that person for 15 minutes? All those people are quarantined, right? You don't have to necessarily give a notice to people beyond your employees. So you'd have to give your employees notice. Um, I'm guessing you're not gonna be permit, you have to clean the work site. Um, and I'm guessing that in a case of a league, you're not gonna be able to operate, you're gonna have to give some type of notice to participants, right? And so in that scenario, you have to be prepared for two things. One is how, what's the downtime, okay? If, if enough people are exposed, you know, we, I had a bar, they opened back up and all their staff was exposed. So as much as they, you know, even though they could legally open up two days from then, they had no one to work the shifts because everyone had to be home for 14 days. And you can't just test. You can't just say, okay, well, there's an exposure. We'll test everybody and then they'll be good because the incubation period. And so that's why there's a quarantine order that's different than isolation order almost in every jurisdiction. The quarantine order says, if you've been exposed to someone, it doesn't matter whether you take a test and pass with flying colors, you need to stay away for 14 days. So, you know, one of these things is you should look and say, okay, if we have an exposure, what's it going to cost? What would the refunds cost? What am I getting back in my premiums? What am I not getting back? I honestly think that because this is a low dollar amount in the grand scheme of things, you know, a participant fee that you're playing, you're paying. The league should ask for more money. They should say here, are all the procedures we're doing. And I know last year was 150 bucks, but it's a whole new world. And so this year we need 200 bucks so we can do this stuff. And I think you need to be able to say and realize that if we get past, you know, a third of our season, we're not going to give refunds. If you're okay with this, sign up the people are going to sign up, right? And then their expectations are going to be managed because the same people are going to sign up are going to be those that are desperate to play. And at that moment, um, they're going to say, oh, I'm just, I'm just ready to go. That's fine. I don't care if I, if I have to go and walk away from 150 bucks and I'm good with 200 bucks because look at all these things. I want all these things, right? All the incentives are aligned right there to make those two asks, to set the expectation. And so, you know, I would be, conscious to not over communicate you know I, i've seen a lot of leagues leagues that i'm a part of um a participant of where they're sending me emails every week keep me up to date i don't need to know the ins and outs right you can let me know that you're considering everything but don't you know make my expectations go like this you know just let me know that you're you're tracking when you can open and as soon as you can open you're going to see if you can do it safely if you have any questions bring them you know filter them here um, I think sending out a survey is a great idea, being very careful to say, you know, this does not make any promises, but my, my company sent out a survey about whether people want to return to work or not and how they want to. And it, it, it informed them a lot about, you know, whether to open up immediately yeah. or let people stay at home. So take that approach with your participants. Yeah. It's a great point. Like this idea of bringing them into the design. Lots, lots of great points. So uh, let's jump into some questions that are coming in uh, and, and throw those out. So one is, and one thing I'll encourage people to upvote if they see questions that resonate with them or go in the Q&A tab and add your own. So Keith Edmondson was making a point that, in, that they've seen um, in, in the case of youth organizations in the South and Georgia and South Carolina, as an example, uh, they don't see that youth organizations are following a lot of certain kinds of safety guidelines. So that may be related to, you know, distancing in dugouts or on the field or masks and officials. So they're struggling between young adults and what kind of satisfaction they want versus going above and beyond the, the current requirements that are happening. So if you're speaking specifically to this adult audience, these organizations that are running these programs for adults around the country, and they're seeing youth in their area do something, what, what's the, what, what, how do you think about rooting their policy and their approach to it? So Ty, I don't know if you have a take to this, and I'll throw it to, to Aaron as well, um, in terms of that, that particular question. Yeah, Ty, you're, you're, you're muted, thanks. Yeah, thanks. I think as an adult league, these organizations can operate slightly differently because of I think liability means a lot more when an adult is t signing up and signing themselves up for a specific sport. For an athlete, their parent is going to be really taking on the liability of, of signing their kids up for a specific sport. 
I think how we handle policies and protocols for a youth organization around health and safety are a lot similar in terms of, I'll call it the health side of it. The safety side could be completely different. But I think when it comes to waivers and liability, directly, if I'm dealing with an adult organization, those adults, if communicated ahead of time, if expectations are communicated ahead of time, you're in a, I, I wouldn't say you're safer, but I just say that those adults signing up for that organization that, and, and following the protocols, making sure that they have masks, you're in a better position to at least see a higher adherence to those policies because you're directly dealing with those adults and it's not a third party, it's not parent. Mm -hmm. The parent may have a different idea around how they want to bring their kid to practice and you have to deal with all these other things. With adults, they either adhere to this or they can't compete. Yeah, I would second Aaron, that. Yeah, th there's a feasibility aspect, right? With adults, it's a lot easier. You know, you, you can say, yeah, kids wear masks. I cannot get my six-year-old or my three-year-old to wear a mask. So if, if, if for some reason the leagues are going to say, a county is going to say you got to put masks on the kids, like, you know, um, number one. Number two, I, I agree with what Ty said, that there's a difference between safety, obviously, in adult leagues and kid leagues. And, and especially the distinction of, in a kid league, the adult's making the decision. And ultimately, the, adult, the adult's making the decision to consent and also whether to sue your ass if they're unhappy about what you've done, right? It's the adult both times making the decision on behalf of a kid. Um, and so you have to put yourself in that adult's shoes, right? A parent's shoes oftentimes and think about it. But this is unique. And by this, I mean a, a, a pandemic that's airborne. And most of the issues that I've seen, um, you know, a restaurant, has to give notice to their um, workers, hey, you know, a, a server came in yesterday, they filled out the questionnaire, they said they were positive, you know, over the weekend they had symptoms, they had a positive test. You know, th those servers, very few, the coworkers are ticked off themselves, right? You know, th th they're, the very few are unhappy that the, that the server that tested positive was in the break room, wasn't respecting social distancing. Where they get unhappy is, you'll see emails saying, Listen, like I live with my grandma or, hey, like I go and like my, my second job is in, in an old age home, you know, it's about who you're exposed to. And so you have to keep in mind that like, yes, there's a lot of people out there that are good to go that like, hey, you know, we're sending all of our kids like we don't care, like the kids ain't going to die from the virus. Um, but at the same time, there may be schools that open up in September that say, listen, in order for you to come to school, you've got to limit your exposure and do these other things. And so like, if you just, the kids just went into your league and then they can't go into schools because you're not respecting certain things. I'm not saying it's going to go down that route, but my point is, is that don't just think, hey, it's a safety issue because, you know, normally it's what happens on the field. This takes place, this risk is taking place off the field. And so you have to just be conscious of the fact that you, whatever the county is requiring you do, if you can't do that, and or you're going to get so much pushback because the participants in your league just, you know, are the same type of people that are going to go in big indoor events without masks, that's not a position you want to put yourself in, right? Why do you want to be liable for a bunch of people that don't want to follow these things? Because inherently, when shit goes bad, you know, it's a whole different ballgame. There's, and there's one last thing about waivers. There's no, law, there's no state that's going to enforce a waiver that is forward facing, okay? The way it works is when you, when you get sued or you, there's a claim brought and you sign what is a waiver or a settlement or a release, that's saying, hey, look, whatever happened in the past, including this, the fact that you're suing me, that's done. Everything's done. This is my silver bullet against that, right? Same thing when you're, you, know, you, you terminate an employee and they sign a severance agreement and saying, hey, I'm releasing. You terminated me and now I'm waiving any claims, right? You're waiving what already happened in the past. When you are trying to take a waiver and say, hey, I'm waiving what's going to happen in the future. I'm waiving that I'm going to, no matter what happens when I come in and play in your league, I'm not going to sue you. That's a different type of waiver. It does, you can't just go into court and say, oh, it's a waiver. It's a piece of evidence where you can say, look, you understood the risks. You understood that if we followed, you know, that if we still followed all these policies and everyone wore a mask, you could still get COVID. Look, that's what we did. We all wore masks. And, you know, you follow the policy, here's the waiver, so you can't bullshit and say you didn't know what we told you, right? But what does that argument rely on? It relies on saying you're going to do masks and doing the masks, right? Because the waiver is just an assumption of risk. And so 
it's even a bad word to use. I have too many people, and who you give it to, you cannot give it to anyone you're providing workers' comp to, okay? Because it conflicts. As a, you know, workers' comp is saying, we're going to cover liability if you get injured here, right? And then a waiver is saying, we're not covering shit if you get injured here. So you can't, you can't if you're giving workers' comp, you can't give the waiver to someone, okay? So anyone, any of your employees, you cannot. You can give the waiver um, to parents, to visitors, to participants, but again, it's, it's much different. You still have to have, uh, you know, most of the waivers that I write say at the very beginning, you are aware that, you know, and all these things, all these precautions we're taking, and you are aware that there is still a huge risk that if you play here, you're not going to hold us liable, that we're going to follow all these things and you could still catch COVID, right? So that's what the wa waivers look like. Yeah, that's a that's a really helpful point. You know, does it Aaron, does it change at all the liability in the sense that if anybody you have no idea where you got COVID from, you could get it from the bus you took to the game or get it from the bar and everything else. Does that change the way the liability should be viewed? Yes, I mean, in, in reality, I don't think knock on wood, I don't think there's going to actually be a lot of liability. Meaning that I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of leagues where you see in you know the Wall Street Journal league has to file bankruptcy because a jury decided that you know, grandpa who was watching his kid got COVID at the league because they weren't wearing masks. I don't think there's going to be stories like that. There's going to be stories that, you know, grandpa's pissed because he thought there were going to be masks. There weren't. And, you know, grandpa's not sure where they got it. But, you know, you know, he's pissed that he came this and it happened here. And he files a claim and grandpa knows some big hot shot attorney. And the league doesn't have the money and, you know, there's an exclusion on the policy. And, you know, you need 25000 out of the gate to defend the lawsuit. So, it's not about being right or wrong. It's just about you can't deal with the onslaught of, of threatened claims or claims that may come your way. Yeah. That's, um, and again, it goes back to some of the, the liability questions that Izzy was talking about. You know, the, a couple, couple last questions here. And Ty, I'll throw this to you, which is ultimately, um, if an organization is, has somebody that's, that's positive or test positive or an employee, like what are the best practices for them to mitigate that risk or to handle that? Uh, I know some of that Aaron was saying was ties to what, what was required at the, the county or state level, but, but but what what should an organization do to prepare for those kinds of eventualities? That's a really good question. So I think the first thing that organizations should definitely do is that there should be a daily report on every attestation they should do. This is a daily thing. So every 24 hours before you show up to practice games, everyone's filling that out. If someone communicates that they've been exposed, then you're looking back to see what last practice game they were exposed to. That whole team then has to be, have to either, well, they both have to be tested and also have to go into quarantine for 14 days. That's just a minimum. And then of course, understanding how that team affected your overall organization, how that's gonna be communicated, because there has to be a communication to the organization that this happened within our organization, there was an exposure, and how that's communicated. You're definitely going to have to connect with your lawyer. I think more. I think that the third-party resources that organizations are going to need around managing this from a liability perspective, everyone should have a lawyer or retainer at this point to how they deal with any incidents, waivers. No one should go this alone, especially when they're opening up initially. No one should go this alone thinking that they're going to draft their own waivers or, or have their own policy set up. They should have an expert that has an E&O <laughs> policy that's that someone that they can point to to say, they gave me this advice and this is the advice I followed. And so I think when it comes to being tested, there has to be, of course, a, 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 a knowing around what who was present at the time of practice or game, who was exposed and how that affected the organization completely. And then how that's being communicated to the members could affect and what the organization, uh, if they stay open or not. And I think organization, they shouldn't try to save their season in this case. They should follow the, the overall process and make sure that anyone that came in contact is communicated, everyone in the organization is communicated, and they should take proper steps around mitigating the likelihood of an additional spread. That's, that's a great point. Um, and before I kick to Aaron, Izzy for some final thoughts, Aaron, one, one thing that came in, which I thought interesting question that's unique for adult organizations is they often have staff that they hire it's also players in the league one of the benefits of being on staff is they get actually get to play in those off nights so 
is it if they're workman comp if it, on one hand if there is a workman comp is affecting their ability to waive liability on the other hand they're also participant in the same kind of programs how do you navigate a situation like that which I, that's a really <laughs> unique question it's a good question um i think you, you should have them sign both the participant package and the um employee package right and you delineate and you'd say you know somewhere else in writing say listen you know you're you're working as an employee of the league on tuesdays thursdays um, as an employee of the league, here are the, here are the ground rules. Here's what you're going to do. Um, here here's the liability. You know where you're covered by workers' comp, um, and you know you're also a participant um, when you're a participant. And you really look without COVID, you got to do a good job of blurring those lines, right? I mean, I could talk about from an employment standpoint of you wanting to be careful because you know you, that's an hourly employee who then later can say I was working the whole time and you didn't pay me, um, and and so. And the same with the injuries, right? Whether it's a participant or an employee, if they get injured cutting the grass versus, you know, running down first base during a game. So you want to, you know, be able to delineate that always and have the documents. And, you know, to Ty's point, you do want to have an attorney or someone you can point the finger to, right? I tell my clients all the time, you know, they'll, they'll use the, the opening documents. They call me when there's an exposure and I'm like, okay, well, I'm preparing the exposure notice to people who potentially are exposed. It's going to say that we've been following guidance as, you know, supplied by X, Y, Z. Did you like, are we good on that? I'm like, well, you know, I, I wrote this last night. I'm like, oh. I'm like, all right, well have me do it. So if something goes sideways, you can sue me and I have malpractice insurance. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> it's, it, it, and you have to be conscious, plan on the exposure, what's going to look like. You know, I've seen lots of leagues, you know, do if you've got 20 teams in the league, do pods of five teams. So if one of the teams and one of the pods goes down, you don't have to shut down the whole league, right? You know, you don't have the situation where on Sunday morning you get an email from someone saying, "Yeah, you know what? I I felt crappy on Saturday. I tested positive now." And you look back, and you're like, "Oh man, that team was on the field at 8 a.m. and was in the dugout, and then we ran the whole league through that field that day." Yeah, it's a good point. And I think, you know, it's, it's a great you know, way to speak to Nate's point and, and also plug the fact that next week we'll be gathering this group again. Uh, and, and I think part of that conversation is understanding different kinds of strategies for innovation and how specific adult organizations have, um, have, have been able to kind of respond to that. And, you know, whether it's, it's thinking about to, to Nate's question, you know, one-time events. So you're not taking on the duration or liability of a longer season, but you're thinking more creatively about specific kinds of events. You know, I, I, I used to think about my own participation in adult leagues uh, before I had to announce my, my official retirement. And, uh, you know, you almost you want to pretend like you're a professional athlete. So make them feel like they're, they're like going to that NBA pod or the MLS tournament, whatever it may be, where, where you can create those kinds of events, uh, still figure out ways of capturing revenue, delivering good experiences, and then having people engage those kinds of things. So I think there's room for creativity next week conversation is there's a lot that I think adult organizations can learn from each other. Certainly that's a key function of the SSIA, as well as, as how adult organizations can learn from youth organizations that are navigating a lot of these questions. And in some cases, even more complicated because trying to get kids to wear masks is at a whole nother level of, of complexity. So I'll, we'll post in the chat tool a link to the industry Slack group that we've set up. It's a place to find adult organizations as well as youth organizations being able to share different ideas, uh, learn how different organizations are approaching return to play around insurance, liability, waivers, uh, what kind of resources or people they're going to, especially if you find organizations in those areas. So again, we'll post that in the chat tool uh, and feel free to sign up for that industry Slack group and, and again, find other organizations that are part of it. Uh, Izzy, when I, 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 as a final word from you, when you sit here and listen to this and you realize that these organizations are just trying to create these great experiences for people to have fun, and now we're spending all our time not talking about rules for kickball or dominance and wiffle ball, but these other things, I guess it, it, it underscores the need for kind of hopefully legislative help to help these organizations navigate a, a, a complicated time, and, and not to mention one that, that, that creates lots of risks for the organizations. Yeah, I mean, Jeremy, you're exactly right. And I think that you all have put together a, a really wonderful coalition of, of folks to, to really push policymakers in Washington to do more and to be more creative. Um, there are tax credit ideas. There are, um, there, there are some great um, ideas for, for, for youth uh, sports, for travel and tourism. Um, that, that members um, on the Democratic side and on the Republican side of the aisles um, are, are considering. Um, we need to keep pushing um, in that direction. We need to keep um, making sure that members are aware um, that we're in the communities and, and we still need help. And, and we're going to be a really big driver 
for the economic recovery. And I think that, that that's something that's really important to remind um, policymakers is that what, when this COVID um, you know, kind of curve really bends down and, and people start to reopen and, and, and begin traveling again, um, we're gonna be a key driver of that. Um, and it's just, it's really important to, to kind of remain vigilant Talk to your members of Congress, talk to your mayors, your Senate, uh, just, just try and be as active as you can be, um, you know, facing outwards a lot more than facing inwards. Excellent. And on that note, Izzy Klein, Aaron Colby, uh, Ty Burks, thank you so much for joining us, providing this kind of insights and perspective. Thank you all to listening. Thanks to the SSIA. Uh, and, and certainly at, at League Apps, we just want to do our part to help you return to play safely and give you access to all the information you need uh, and, of course, the technology you need as well. So with that, uh, we're signing off. Thanks for joining us. Feel free to continue the conversation with the Slack group. And if you have more questions for our panelists, we'll follow up with them as well. Have Thanks, a great guys. day.